It is a March morning in Boston in 1770. The town is tense and abuzz with talk. The night before a massacre had occurred near the Custom House. Five Bostonians were killed, shot by British soldiers. On this morning, a merchant named James Forrest visits the office of a 34-year-old Boston attorney. Forrest has tears streaming from his eyes. He asks the attorney if he would defend the British soldiers and their captain, Thomas Preston. The young lawyer understands the consequence of taking the case. He will be subject to criticism. His involvement will jeopardize his legal practice. It even risks the safety of himself and his family. But he believes deeply that every person deserves a defense, and he agrees to take the case. For his effort, he will receive the modest sum of 18 guineas. The young attorney is John Adams, future drafter of the Declaration of Independence and the second president of the United States. He will pay a price for his decision to represent the British soldiers and their captain, but it is a decision that he is proud of for the rest of his life. In the snowy winter of 1770, many residents of Boston had a gripe. They were deeply resentful of the presence of the British military in their city. Regiments of regulars had been quartered in Boston for nearly a year and a half after responding to a call by the governor to restore order and respect for British law. Trouble had arisen in 1768 when Boston importers refused to pay the customs duties required under British law. Bostonians had a variety of complaints about the British soldiers. Some resented the fact that soldiers competed for jobs. The soldiers often took part-time work during their off-duty hours for lower wages than the natives were willing to accept. Seamen in Boston saw the soldiers as enforcers of the detested impressment laws laws that authorized soldiers to seize men and force them to serve in the British Navy. Clashes between soldiers and civilians were on the rise in 1770. On March 2nd, a fistfight broke out between soldiers and employees of John Gray's Rope Walk, a cable-making company. Tempers flared when one of the soldiers was insulted by an employee. The employee reportedly asked the passing soldier, do you want work? The soldier replied, yes, he would like to find some extra work. But the employee's response was not what the soldier had hoped. Well then, go clean out my outhouse. The angry soldier left only to return later with a dozen fellow soldiers and predictably the encounter ended in a brawl. Three days later on March 5th, things turned from bad to worse. The problems began in the evening with a simple dispute over whether a British soldier had paid a bill to a local wig maker. The officer was walking down King Street when Edward Garrick, the wig maker's apprentice, called out to him. There goes the fellow who hath not paid my master for dressing his hair. The officer with the new hair, Captain John Goldfinch, ignored Garrick. But Garrick persisted. He told three passers-by that Goldfinch owed him money. A British soldier named Hugh White, who was standing sentry that night outside the Custom House, overheard Garrick's remarks. White told the apprentice, He is a gentleman, and if he owes you anything, he will pay for it. Garrick answered, There is no such thing as a gentleman in the regiment. Now that remark got the sentry's hackles up. He left his post and confronted Garrick, and there was a brief, heated exchange of words before White struck Garrick with his musket, knocking him down. A small crowd was attracted by the ruckus. People gathered around the lone guard and began to taunt him. Bloody lobster back, lousy rascal, lobster son of a bitch. The crowd grew to about 50. Some young men threw pieces of ice at White, causing him to retreat from his sentry box to the custom house steps and load his gun. He waved the gun around frantically and knocked on the door of the custom house. Desperate and fearful, White called out, Turn out, main guard. Meanwhile, a few blocks north, another confrontation between civilians and redcoats broke out. 
Under a barrage of snowballs, a group of soldiers hustled into its barracks. A third mob, this one about 200 strong and carrying clubs, gathered on Dock Street. A tall man with a white wig and a red coat did his best to rile up the crowd. Troubles erupting all over the city. Let's away to the main guard, someone shouted. And the crowd streamed down an alley toward King Street. When someone pulled the fire bell rope at the brick meeting house, the ringing bell brought dozens of more residents out into the streets. In front of the main guard, the officer for the day, Captain Thomas Preston, paced back and forth for nearly 30 minutes. He couldn't decide what to do. If he did nothing, he thought White might be killed by the mob. But trying to rescue White carried its own risks. The soldiers were vastly outnumbered by the mob. Moreover, Preston knew that province law forbade the military from firing on civilians without the order of a magistrate. And finally, Preston made his decision. Turn out, damn your bloods, turn out, he yelled. Seven soldiers hurried out, some without even putting on their coats. Preston and the other man in columns of two moved across King Street with the muskets and fixed bayonets. They pushed on through the crowd of 50 to 100 civilians near the Custom House. And finally, they reached the beleaguered sentry. Preston ordered White to fall into line and to start to march back to the main guard. But the mob blocked them. Hemmed in, the soldiers lined up in a semicircle facing the crowd. Many in the crowd threw missiles of various sorts. The soldiers were facing flying chunks of coal, snowballs, and oyster shells. And here the accounts begin to vary. But the most likely story is this. Captain Preston shouts for the crowd to disperse, but it continues to press in. A large mixed race man named Crispus Attic steps forward, wielding a club. Attic grabs the soldier's bayonet and knocks him to the ground. The soldier named Hugh Montgomery rises and shouts, damn you, fire. In spurts, not in volleys, soldiers fire six leaden balls into the crowd. The shots kill four men, including Crispus Attucks. Another victim would die 10 days later from his injuries. Then a blast from the gun of soldier Matthew Kilroy hits Samuel Gray as he stands with his hands in his pockets. The blast blows a hole in Gray's head as big as a hand. A 17-year-old apprentice to an ivory turner as well as a sailor are also hit in the chest, and both die from their injuries. Another half dozen civilians lie seriously injured along King Street. As several soldiers load their weapons and prepare to fire again, Captain Preston yells, stop firing, do not fire. The Boston Massacre is over. It's been almost two and a half centuries since that moonlit March night in 1770, and people still debate responsibility for the Boston Massacre. Does the blame rest with the crowd of Bostonians who hurled the insults, the snowballs, the oyster shells, and the other objects of the soldiers? Or does the blame rest with the British soldiers for violating laws of the colony that prohibited firing at civilians? And these were the questions also addressed in the Boston courtroom. And the British captain and his soldiers had on their side to tell their story one of the most important people in American history. When word of the shootings reached acting Governor Thomas Hutchinson, he rushed to King Street. There he found an angry crowd and a shaken Captain Preston. Hutchinson confronted Preston. Don't you know you can't fire on anybody without the order of a magistrate? He asked. After talking with Preston, Hutchinson proceeded upstairs in the town house where several members of the council had gathered. He assured council members that he would do his best to see justice done. Then the acting governor stepped out onto the balcony overlooking the scene of the massacre. He called for the crowd to be calm. Let the law have its course. I will live and die by the law, he said. After midnight, the sheriff obtained a warrant for the arrest of Captain Preston. Preston was taken to the townhouse and interrogated by two justices. At three o'clock in the morning, the justices concluded that they had evidence sufficient to commit him. Preston was escorted to jail where he remained for the next seven months.
It was a few hours later that Boston merchant James Forrest secured John Adams to represent the British captain and his soldiers. As Adams remembered the meeting, Forrest assured him, as God Almighty is my judge, I believe him an innocent man. Adams supposedly replied, as a good lawyer might, that must be ascertained by his trial. And if he thinks he cannot have a fair trial on that issue without my assistance, without hesitation, he shall have it. A week after the massacre, at the request of the Attorney General, a grand jury handed down murder indictments against Captain Preston and eight soldiers. About the same time, Preston offered his version of the events of March 5 in a deposition. About nine o'clock, I witnessed a great commotion in the streets. I heard people use most cruel and horrid threats against the troops. Preston said he learned from a townsperson that the mob planned to carry his sentry away from his post and murder him. He felt he had no choice but to immediately send soldiers to protect both the sentry and the king's money, which was lodged in the custom house. His goal, he said, was to prevent the officer and the soldiers, because of the insults and provocations of the rioters, from being thrown off their guard and committing some rash act. Preston also pleaded his case in the press. His jail cell writings appeared in the Boston Gazette. In one letter to the paper, Preston extended his thanks to Bostonians who, quote, throwing aside all party and prejudice, have with the utmost humanity and freedom stepped forth as advocates for the truth in defense of my injured innocence. Unfortunately for Preston, a letter he had sent to London intended for solely a British audience also found its way into the Boston papers. The letter to London undermined whatever goodwill he built up earlier. In his London letter, Preston complained about Bostonians who, quote, have ever used all means in their power to weaken the regiments and to bring them into contempt by promoting and aiding desertions and by grossly and falsely promulgating untruths concerning them. He wrote that the malcontents were maliciously using every method to fish out evidence to prove that the March 5th shooting was a concerted scheme to murder the inhabitants. As Preston and the eight indicted soldiers languished in jail, Boston residents, including such notable figures as Samuel Adams and John Hancock, pressed demands on Governor Hutchinson for the instant removal of all British troops from the city of Boston. Hutchinson balked at the demand, but finally gave in to overwhelming public pressure. The two regiments evacuated the city and moved to Castle William in Boston Harbor. Samuel Adams also busied himself in today's jargon with what we'd call spin control. He participated in writing a short narrative of the horrid massacre in Boston. The narrative was a decidedly slanted anti-British account of events. The goals of the publication were to refute charges that Bostonians were the aggressors in the incidents and to build up public pressure against the British military. In letters to the Boston Gazette, Samuel Adams became the principal defender of Crispus Attucks, denying accounts that Attucks attacked the soldier with a club. Adams argued that Attucks, quote, had as good a right to carry a stick, even a bludgeon, as a soldier who shot him had to be armed with a musket and a ball. Authorities decided to try Captain Preston separately from the eight soldiers. The soldiers objected to this arrangement in a letter to the court. We poor distressed, distressed prisoners beg that ye be so good as to let us have our trial at the same time with our captain. For we did our captain's orders, and if we did not obey his command, should have been confined and shot for not doing it. The soldiers feared that Preston's best defense was to deny that he gave any order to fire. Their best defense, on the other hand, was to claim that they were only following the captain's orders. If Preston proceeded to trial first, then their defense would be compromised. The conflict between the interests of Preston and the interests of the soldiers presented a dilemma for John Adams, who had agreed to defend them both. Now, under the ethical standards of today, Adams should clearly have made a choice between representing either Preston or the soldiers. Conflicts such as these, however, were viewed differently in the 1700s, and the soldiers' request for a joint trial was denied by the court without explanation. 
Captain Preston came to trial first. His trial ran for six days in October 1770 at Queen Street Courthouse. Adams chose to keep the trial focused on the events on King Street. Although his co-consul argued for producing evidence of the earlier troubles between the citizens and the soldiers, Adams saw a danger in that strategy. Yes, the evidence might show a concerted plot by radicals to expel soldiers from the city of Boston. But, Adams suggested, the evidence concerning King Street events would be sufficient to acquit. Besides, he worried, opening up a political attack on the citizens' efforts to expel the British troops might spark a public reaction that would weaken his case. Even worse, Adams thought, if we stir this political pot, radicals might storm the jail. They might lynch Preston. They might terrorize jurors into voting for a conviction. The defense decided to keep its focus narrow. The central issue in Preston's trial was whether the captain gave the order to fire on civilians. Preston's steadfast denial was supported by three defense witnesses. Four witnesses for the prosecution, however, swore that he gave the fatal order. The most convincing of the prosecution witnesses was Daniel Califf. He testified, I was present at the firing. I heard one of the guns rattle. I turned about and looked and heard the officer who stood on the right in a line with the soldiers give the word to fire twice. I looked the officer in the face when he gave the word and I saw his mouth. He had a red coat, a yellow jacket and silver laced hat, no trimming on his coat. I saw his face plain, the moon shone on it. Although the trial was transcribed in shorthand, no copy survives. We can, however, surmise the testimony of Captain Preston from the deposition he gave in advance of the trial. In it, he described the rising tension on the night of March 5. I was between the soldiers and the mob, endeavoring all in my power to persuade them to retire peacefully. Preston offered this account of the actual shooting. Some well-behaved persons asked me if the guns were charged. I replied, yes. Then they asked me if I intended to order the men to fire, and I answered, no, by no means, observing to them that I was advanced before the muzzles of the men's pieces and must, be, must fall a sacrifice if they fired. My giving the word fire under those circumstances would prove me to be no officer. While I was thus speaking, one of the soldiers, having received a severe blow with a stick, stepped a little on one side and instantly fired. Turning to and asking him why he fired without orders, I was struck by a club on my arm, which for some time deprived me of the use of it. On this, a general attack was made on the men by a great number of heavy clubs and snowballs being thrown at them, by which all our lives were in imminent danger. Some persons at the same time from behind called out, Damn your bloods, why don't you fire? And instantly three or four of the soldiers fired, one after another and directly after three more in the same confusion and hurry. A 12-man jury was sequestered over the six-day course of the trial. They survived in a diet of biscuits, cheese, cider, and liquor. When it came time to deliberate, they concluded that the testimony of Preston and the other defense witnesses was enough to raise a reasonable doubt as to whether Captain Preston ever gave the order to fire. They deliberated only a few hours before acquitting Preston on all charges. Given the loyalist leanings of one or more of the jurors, a conviction which required a unanimous verdict, really never was a possibility. One juror reportedly confided before trial he would never convict Preston, quote, if he sat to all eternity. The captain was, the juror said, as innocent as the child unborn. A transcript of the trial that followed, the trial of the eight soldiers, survives. The case is formally called Rex versus Weems et al. The transcript gives us a much more complete picture of this trial compared to what we know about the trial of Captain Preston. In the soldiers' trial, several witnesses testified about how tensions built up in the few days before the massacre. Witnesses described the military-civilian confrontation at Gray's Rope Walk three days before the massacre as well as other events that occurred on the night of March 5 near King Street. The prosecution's most damning testimony came from Samuel Hemingway. 
Hemingway told jurors about a conversation involving Private Matthew Kilroy. Kilroy was the soldier identified by another prosecution witness as the shooter of John Gray, one of the five men killed in the massacre. Hemingway testified that Kilroy said he would never miss an opportunity when he had one to fire on the inhabitants and that he had wanted to have an opportunity ever since he landed. John Adams, however, presented testimony to support the theory that the soldiers fired in self-defense. One defense witness, James Bailey, testified that the soldiers were being pelted by large chunks of ice and other dangerous objects. He told jurors that he saw Crispus Attucks knock down Private Montgomery with a large cordwood stick. Adams asked the jury to put themselves in the soldiers' shoes. Would it have been a prudent resolution in them or in anybody in their situation to have stood still to see if the mob would knock their brains out? An especially compelling piece of defense evidence came in the form of a dying statement of Patrick Carr, one of the victims of the massacre. Carr died more than a week after being shot. He made a statement to his surgeon on his deathbed. The admission of this deathbed statement into evidence is the first recorded use of the dying declaration exception to the rule that generally excludes statements made by someone other than a witness to prove the truth of the matter asserted. These statements are what lawyers call hearsay evidence. The transcript reports the following exchange. Was you Patrick Carr's surgeon? I was. Was he apprehensive of his danger? He told me as a native of Ireland that he had frequently seen mobs and soldiers called upon to quell them. He'd seen soldiers often fire on people in Ireland, but had never seen them bear half so much before they fired in his life. When had you had the last conversation with him? About four o'clock in the afternoon, preceding the night on which he died, and he then particularly said he forgave the man, whoever it was, that shot him. He was satisfied he had no malice, but fired to defend himself. After presenting over 40 witnesses, John Adams summed up for the defense. His eloquent speech blended law and politics. He told the jury this was a case of self-defense. He asked the jury to consider what any soldier would do under the confusing and life-threatening conditions. Do you expect that he should act like a stoic philosopher, lost in apathy? He concluded by arguing that the facts and the law supported the soldiers. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence nor is the law less stable than the fact. If an assault was made to endanger their lives, the law is clear. They had a right to kill in their own defense. If it was not so severe as to endanger their lives, yet if they were assaulted at all, struck and abused by blows of any sort, by snowballs, oyster shells, cinders, clubs, or sticks of any kind, this is a provocation for which the law reduces the offense of killing down to manslaughter and those consideration of those passions in our nature which cannot be eradicated. To your candor and justice, I submit the prisoners and their cause. Justices Trowbridge and Oliver instructed the jury. Justice Trowbridge told the 12 men of Boston that, quote, malice is the grand criterion that distinguishes murder from all other homicides. Justice Oliver discussed Patrick Carr's dying declaration this car was not upon oath, it is true, but you will determine whether a man just stepping into eternity is not to be believed, especially in favor of a set of men by whom he had lost his life. After less than three hours deliberation, the jury acquitted six of the soldiers on all charges. Hugh Montgomery and Matthew Kilroy, the only two soldiers proven to have fired, were found guilty of manslaughter. On December 14th, Montgomery and Kilroy returned to the court for sentencing. The court asked if there was any reason why the sentence should not be passed. The two men responded by invoking the benefit of clergy. This was a plea available in this type of case that shifted their punishment from imprisonment to the branding of their thumbs. 
As John Adams looked on, the two British soldiers held out their right thumbs for Stephen Greenleaf to brand. Captain Preston sailed back to England. He received modest compensation and a 200 pound annual pension for all his troubles. Safely back home, Preston gloated over what he called, quote, the complete victory obtained over the knaves and foolish villains of Boston. John Adams defended Preston, but that is not to say he either befriended or admired his British client. Years later, Preston and Adams met on a London street and they passed without exchanging a word. In Massachusetts, reactions to the verdict varied. Samuel Adams, a cousin of John Adams, expressed his displeasure in a letter he signed Vindex. They not only fired without the order of a civil magistrate, but they never called for one, which they might easily have done. They went down armed with muskets and bayonets fixed, presuming they were clothed with as much authority by the law of the land as the posse comitatus of the country with a high sheriff at their head. To keep the memory of the massacre alive, Samuel Adams arranged to have March 5 set aside as an annual day of mourning. And each year for the next 13, Bostonians gathered for bell ringing, candlelit displays, and oratory. The initial reaction of most Bostonians to John Adams for his defense of the soldiers was hostile. His law practice dropped by over half in the year following the trials. Adams, however, was of a different opinion. He found the verdicts deeply satisfying. Years later, after an illustrious career that took him to the White House, he reflected on his role in the Boston Massacre trial. The part I took in the defense of Captain Preston and the soldiers procured me anxiety and obloquy enough. It was, however, one of the most gallant, generous, manly, and disinterested actions of my whole life, and one of the best pieces of service I ever rendered my country. Judgment of death against those soldiers would have been a foul stain on this country as the execution of the Quakers or the witches anciently. As the evidence was, the verdict of the jury was exactly right. Yes, given the conflicting evidence the jurors heard, the verdict was exactly right. That is not to say, however, that the soldiers acted appropriately. When one reads the 96 depositions taken in the Preston trial, it is fairly obvious that before the massacre, many British soldiers acted as bullies and were looking for trouble. The soldiers ended up getting into more trouble than they bargained for. And then they reacted as one might expect in a life-threatening situation. Reaction to the Boston Massacre and the subsequent trials reflected the heated partisanship of the times. Samuel Adams continued to rail against the verdicts, complaining about the misuse of evidence and instructions overly favorable to the defense. Governor Hutchinson praised the verdicts and called Samuel Adams' criticisms sophistry. Samuel Adams fanned the flames of opposition to military occupation in Boston. He hoped the public outrage over the verdicts could lead to a speedy exit of British troops from his city. Trials decide the fate of defendants, but sometimes they also influence the fate of nations. After the trials, a sort of surface normalcy returned to Boston. But beneath the surface, in the hearts and minds of many citizens, resentment still ran deep. The revolution was coming.